GCN's final Google Live Hangout on Air of the Year. Today I'm joined by Daniel Lloyd and Matt Stevens, and we're going to be asking all your cycling related questions. So, Matt, how are you doing? Not too bad at all, thank you very much. Yes, uh, yeah, not too bad at all. Looking forward to uh, sharing, uh, yeah, sharing some insight into. Uh, I'll have a quick look at the questions. It looks like there's a nice variety of questions that uh, obviously the, the viewers and, and watchers of, C of Global Cycle Network have, have put forward. So let's get cracking. Definitely. Dan, how are you doing over there? I'm very well, thank you, and I'd like to welcome you all into uh, my bedroom here. It's not something I've been able to say much in my life so far. <laughs> Quite a neutral colour scheme you've got in there, in there, Dan, but yeah, I'm liking it. So, Dan, we should probably pick up, there's, there's one question that was solely for you from Facebook, which Stephen Pink has asked, when are you going to turn up to the White Ways Hill Climb and show them how it's done properly? Uh, well, I think the answer to that question is that I'm, I will probably not be going back to White Ways Hill in the near future because whilst I was still quite fit, I went over there when I had a howling tailwind and just nailed the climb to the point where I'd never ever be able to get anywhere near the time that I did up there and hopefully no one else will be able to either. Uh, and if they do, I might have to take a drive out in my car and go up it. Okay. Nice that's, one to there. that's pretty conclusive. So I guess tenuously linked to, well not even tenuously, earlier in, no, this time last week we had a video on what is a climber and in response to that a load of people have come in with their favourite climbers. So Dan, who was your favourite climber when you were growing up? Uh, I, think any, I think everybody from, uh, from well, I guess from most generations really, my generation in particular, like the heroes that you had, you, you kind of get chastised for even mentioning their names sometimes because of what's happened in the uh, post interim period and what we found out about the uh, you know the state that cycling was in at that time but I think like everybody really you looked up to, to Pantani who who just seemed to be able to do what he wanted on a bike at any point on a climb and uh, you know so gracious to, to watch going up mountains and somebody I always just looked up to when I was uh, you know growing up and racing and uh, you know he's still a huge hero in Italy now he doesn't seem to have the same stigma that maybe he does in uh, in the uh, English-speaking parts of the world, but um, I think him from the past, but Quintana for me at the moment is uh, somebody who's hugely exciting that uh, seems to be able to disrupt even the most well-drilled of teams. I'm talking about Sky, of course, and uh, you know of all of the people this year, he was really the only guy who who really started to put them into trouble. And Matt, I believe you actually raced Pantani back in the day. Yeah, I raced. Uh with uh, Marco Pantani when I did the Giro in 2000 and um, it was just on a bit of a comeback um, so he sort of struggled for the first first part of that race but very much like Dan you know although I had the kind of yeah the honour really of riding with him at the time and uh, like you say the, the, there is a stigma attached to him but it, it certainly isn't the case over in Italy he is regarded as an absolute legend of, of, of the sport but regardless of, of the the context that he, some of his rides were set within, he, he, was a, he was a beautiful example of, of how to climb. You know, um, he was very, very graceful, could chop and change the tempo. And I think, although, you know, he, I wouldn't say he's one of my heroes, he's one of the riders I admired. Um, when I was a child, you know, growing up and getting into the sport, you know, that I posted on the wall of Robert Miller um, and of Luis Herrera um, from, uh, you know, one of the Polkadot jersey in the Tour de France back in the 80s. And was the first sort of he was one of the first pure climbers from Colombia, and I think he he him and Fabio Parra uh, were two of the the climbers that I looked up to, primarily because they climbed in a way that's extremely different to the way a lot of the climbers ride. ride say like you know obviously like Bradley and Froome, although Froome can accelerate like he's still but he's still like a tempo rider. And the beauty of those Colombian climbers back in the 80s was the way they disrupted the guys who couldn't who couldn't climb particularly well. Indiran didn't like riding against the Colombians because Indiran was again a bit like Bradley, liked a constant tempo. But you know those guys, Herrera and Para particularly, didn't really look that great on a bike. But boy, could they climb and, and they they climbed with grace and they and they I just loved the way they could change the tempo. But very much like Robert Miller as well, exciting riders to watch and they're the kind of climbers that I grew up with. So yeah, I'd say they're my favourites. I think caution wasn't a word that figured in any of their kind of pre-race tactic talks. No, certainly not. So I guess if we Actually, sticking with climbers, some people, when we asked them who their favourite climber was, said that Lance was, in fact, their favourite climber. So, is Lance a climber, Matt? Um, I don't think he's a pure climber, but what he 
what he was able to do, <laughs> it's very difficult talking about Lance now um, because, you know, of, of what people's suspicions were for many years and obviously uh, only nine months ago, whatever it is now, Lance admitted to doping through, throughout his whole career, effectively. And every single one of his tour wins, he effectively cheated. So it is very, very difficult to talk about Lance. But if you, you take that side of it away, you know, he was still a quite an amazing athlete. And the way he climbed, it was like no other. I mean, uh, and when you do look back, it was almost ridiculous the way he just tore it up. Um, but what he did introduce, whether you like it or not, was, was riding at a very, very high cadence. So as a spectacle... When you look back, you know, against his contemporaries, you know, one of which was Jan Ulrich, and Ulrich climbed very differently, you know, um, probably partly due to the fact that he could ride at high cadence, probably because he was on performance enhancing drugs, primarily EPO, uh, made him ride with a particular style, or he had the ability to ride very, very, very explosively. And at the time, it was something to watch. Now we know it wasn't quite what it was made out to be, but regardless of that, he climbed very well, but I wouldn't call him a pure climber. I don't know what Dan, what you think, Dan? I think you know, we, I think we pigeonhole pure climbers almost into this sort of group of people that can climb very well but can't time trial at all. And I think in some ways that ends up being a bit unfair on, uh, you know, some of the guys who, who you know, like Chris Froome, for example, this year was arguably the best climber in the tour. But we talk about Quintana as the climber because. He's no good in time trials in comparison to, to Chris Froome. And so I think, it, you know, in some ways that was quite similar with, with Lance. And as you said, mate, it's quite hard to talk about him these days. But at the time, you know, he was effectively the best climber in the Tour de France. Yes, he was the best time trials. But it was very rare that he got beaten by a pure climber in the uh, in stage of the Tour de France. You no, know, he, he let Pantani, who we were just talking about a little bit earlier, you know, win the stage up 1-2 by... You know, riding with him and letting him come past at the line that caused a, a bit of controversy between the two of them at the time. But you know, I think it, yes, he was a climber during his years of winning the Tour de France or whatever you want to call that now. But I guess in some ways, the fact that he was climbing so well was uh, you know, what set alarm bells ringing for a lot of journalists and, and fans really because he hadn't he, he hadn't had that ability up climbs before he came back from cancer. Mm. Okay, so moving on from Lance on to, I guess, his German kind of rival Ulrich. We're now, we've got a question from Velo Home Podcast on Twitter, who's asking about the current crop of German riders. So, of course, there's Jascha Suterlin, who's signed for Movistar from next year, and then the sprinters, Kittel, Degenkolb, Greipel, and Tony Martin. So, Matt? Yeah, I mean, um, from there, I mean, there is a, you know, after, you know, the, the, I mean, the revelations in relation to Jan Ulrich have been a little bit slow drip, you know, a bit of a drip feed situation uh, compared to, you know, um, Lance admitting things. And, um, and obviously the German media primarily have, you know, effectively, you know, um, refused to broadcast any coverage of a lot of major races. And as a direct result, German professional cycling has been in the doldrums. But, you know, thankfully, you've got, we've got Argos Shimano primarily and another other teams with extremely good German riders in. You know, um, and, and obviously, what they seem to have done, they seem to have got a very, very nurturing um, environment at, at Argo Shimano, brought through, you know, a tremendous strength, strength and depth, primarily in relation to sprinters. You could argue now that Germany is the powerhouse in terms of riders, you know, in terms of depth in relation to um, sprinters. Um, so I think German cycling, German professional cycling, is going through a little bit of a renaissance. And, and the good thing is, is that these guys have signed long-term contracts. You tell us signed long-term contract with Arvid Shimano. Um, so at and there's a couple of other very young 21-year-olds in that team as well who are you know, getting a bit of a run for the money. So it's very, very good for German cycling, um, without a doubt. Um, and I think Dan would obviously, I think, he'd probably uh, echo that sentiment. Yeah, I think, you know, we've got a great group of, of German cyclists at the moment and um, you know, we, we obviously think in the UK we're having a massive boom in terms of all things cycling and also with Team Sky and but I think at the same time you know, Germany's still got more pro tour riders or world tour riders than, than we have. The trouble is they haven't got many races and they haven't got any sort of top level teams anymore but basically the current crop of, of riders, the likes of uh, the Greipel etc, you know, they're people that were inspired by Jan Ulrich and uh, you know, again whatever you say about the guy now he He's brought on a group of or a generation of riders who, you know, wanted to ride a bike because of him. And I think it's probably only a matter of time before 
you know, we see another German team coming in or we see television coverage in that country sort of increased again or even the tour of Germany, which hasn't been around for some time now. But I can, you know, sympathise for the guys a bit at the moment, you know, the likes of Marcel Cattell, who's effectively answering questions from a generation before him. And, you know, he's won three or four stages at the Tour de France this year. And, uh, you know, I guess he wishes that he was in a big German World Tour team, not to say that, you know, he's not happy in Argos Shimano, but I think, yeah, in a you know, matter of a few years, once that clean generation grows up, there'll be, uh, you know, a massive amount of interest in cycling again, because I know for a fact that there's still a huge number of participants in, in German sportifs, you know, not just from outside of Germany, but also Germans themselves. But not Jan, because Jan is banned by the German Cycling Federation from riding in sportifs, I believe they banned Ulrich. Um, so the thought of the German team for the Qatar Worlds must be quite exciting, Dan. Yeah, I'm actually going to be. I think like the the tour, the Qatar Worlds is going to be one of those races that's either going to be one of the most exciting of all times or the most boring. I think it very much obviously you know the tour of Qatar is very much dependent on the, which way the wind blows or if it blows at all. Of course, the World Championship is going to be presumably on a circuit, although we haven't got details yet. But if the wind really blow strong, which it can do out there, and it's so exposed, you know, it's only a matter of time in the opening stages of the race that one team's going to say to themselves, well, you know, if we don't blow it apart now, then somebody else is going to, and we're not have as many people at the front. So it could be it could be a world championship where rather than waiting until the last lap or two to see any of the action from the real big hitters, we might see some really big action in the opening laps. Yeah, I think it could be really good and I mean, who are Germany going to have as their sprinter there between Degenkolb, Greipel and Kittel? It's going to be quite a lead-out train, potentially. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be on that team beat today, especially if they're all on form. It's going to be, going to be interesting. Definitely <laughs> exciting, anyway. Awesome. So, if we move on to our next question, we've got one from earlier about maybe we'll move on to some winter training stuff. So, a couple of people have... Actually, one, one guy on Facebook, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name, but you'd... You were originally based in Hawaii, and you've moved to Britain. So you've asked, should you be riding slower in colder weather? I, I, I'll fire off if you want first. Um, yeah, I think it depends on what what your your ambitions are. You know, um, whether you uh, are look, going to be looking at racing yeah. um, the following season, or whether you're looking at you know um, sport sportive. So de depends. On, it purely depends. I mean, right, you don't really need to necessarily ride slowly. I mean, um, I think. Steady state miles, if you're looking to race yeah. with these sportifs next year, um, are going to be important. But it's not necessarily riding slowly. It's, it's riding at a tempo that's going to keep you warm, purely dependent uh, on what your aims and ambitions are. But if you're looking at racing, then I, I would say from you know um, in March or you know, April, uh, the start of next year, this, this time of year, it's not, it's not about riding slowly. It's about riding steadily and then building up the tempo into the following year. And then you start to introduce intervals. It's, you purely need to sort of... Uh, to answer that question fully, you'd need to understand what that person's ambitions are. But uh, no, I think the, the winter, especially pre-Christmas, is a time to enjoy riding your bike. It's probably the best way to put it. Whether you ride steadily or a little bit quick is completely up to you. But um, I think you can afford this time of year to uh, you know, get yourself into things more steadily than you would, obviously, in January or February when you really need to up things intensity-wise. And I think we would probably all prefer to be cycling in Hawaii. Definitely. Than yes. facing the frosts yeah. here in Britain. Although Stephen, uh, sorry about that. Someone, one of our viewers, has commented in and said that we don't know what winter is because we've never had winter in Ontario, Canada, which moves I nicely. Sorry, probably won't argue with that actually. Yeah. <laughs> so it kind of moves nicely onto the next question. So uh, Koshik Narayanam, sorry if I've said your name slightly wrong there, has asked: After Heshadal's Giro win in 2012, do you think that another Canadian can stand on the top step of a Grand Tour podium? Perhaps Dan, you did you ride with Ryder on? Yeah, I've seen teammates of Ryder a couple of years ago. Um, I don't see any reason any reason why not. I mean, five years ago oh. we uh, we had Team Sky come on the scene, and their principal Dave Brailsford was saying to us that he wanted a British winner of the Tour de France in within five years, and in fact that happened after about three, and then after four we had a second British winner, albeit one that was born in Kenya. Um, and so I don't see any particular reason why Canada shouldn't find another Grand Tour champion in the in the near future. They've got a good, rich history in the sport with Steve Bauer as well, doing fantastic rides in Paris Bay and many other races. So, you know, I think, again, uh, Ryder would have been an inspiration last year when he won the Giro d'Italia and got all that publicity back in Canada. And, uh, yeah, I think, you know, in the future we might well see another one. Cool. 
just echo those yeah. sentiments for another obviously, <laughs> Canadian was Alex Steeder in, a, in a, I think it was 86 who took the yellow jersey in the Tour de France um, and, a, and there was a, a Canadian rider this year who rode from uh, Europe yeah, uh, David, who, uh, yeah. but he's retired uh, yeah. to become a, 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 I believe a lawyer so he was he was a rider that uh, I straight away thought of but uh, I just echo the sentiments of Dan it's a shame we've lost that rider uh, but I'm sure but under the inspiration of Ryan Heistab, you know, there should be other riders coming through. Um, so, what, Matt, one for you. What, what transfers do you think are going to play a part in next season's kind of racing? Or what are you anticipating? Are there any big moves that have stood out for you this year? I think the, the, the major move uh, is, the interesting one, is Rui Costa, you know, uh, yeah. going across to Lampre. I think that's a move that not many people would have expected. It's not that uh, Lamprey are a particularly good team. It's just that uh, Mobistar are a team, you know, that's particularly uh, strong, uh, strong in depth. But I think perhaps Costa was uh, a little bit further down the pecking order than he would have wanted. Obviously, with Valverde in there and, and Quintana as well. Perhaps he wanted to go to a team that's um, a little bit smaller and that he would be the defined leader in the Grand, in possibly the Grand Tour and, and in the uh, potentially the Ardennes Classics. Um, so that that move is going to be interesting because uh, mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see how you know with the ex teammate of Alverde. Um, you know, I think that's the move for me. What Dan think? So yeah, Dan, what do you think? Um, of I think there's a few interesting ones. I think you know Mikel Niev going from Escatel to Sky could be fairly interesting. Although I think he will end up as just another guy that ends up riding on the front on the climbs. And uh, the person going out of Sky, Rigoberto Uran, who's shown so much promise for so many years now and achieved a podium position in the Tour of Italy this year, I think you know, his move to Omega Farm Quick Step is interesting on two accounts. First of all, to see how much he can develop himself when coming outside of the shadows of, of Broom and Wiggins and everybody else that was at Team Sky, but also how much freedom he really gets at Omega Farm Quick Step, which is you know builds around Tom Boone and large and also Mark Cavendish. Uh, you know, I'd be interested to see which, which of the Grand Tours Rigoberto Uran targets next year. I'd love to see him do something well, but you know, in the last few years we've seen Mark Cavendish ride both the Giro d'Italia and the Tour de France, and for the last two of those years he's finished both of them both times. So you know, he's going to have uh, a good few riders around him, and I fear a little bit that Uran's going to be left somewhat lacking in terms of support if he is doing well. Yeah, I mean, just, just on that note, it was interesting, uh, you know, depending on what, what press you read, that uh, Cavendish might, I don't know whether he's doing the Giro or not, that might open up the door for Iran to be protected fully. Because um, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, Patrick Lefebvre felt that Cav was a little bit tired and a little bit cut. He's, you know, some of the, his output, his power output wasn't quite, I think he was 30 watts lower than, than, than normal going into the Tour de France. And that could obviously, you know, perhaps that was why he looked a little bit under par, not to take anything away from Marcel Cattell. But um, if that's the way that Lefebvre is thinking that will open the door for Iran, but as as Dan rightly said, you know, um, it's an interesting dynamic, you know, with a potential Grand Tour winner on the team and somebody's going to pick up a hat for the stages, and of course with Tom Boone, in fact, who's been out of the, out of the frame injured this year, and of course Tony Martin in the mix. So very very interesting. It's going to be an exciting season without a doubt. It's almost like Iran has taken Cav's seat at Sky, so he's the yeah the, the odd one out, so yeah. to speak, and you can't quite see how they're going to going to manage both. So if we move on from transfers, we've got quite a nice question from the guy Linehan on YouTube who's asked, he's getting his first road bike at Christmas and do, does he need cycling shoes? What, what difference are a pair of cycling shoes going to make to this guy's riding? Uh, I think a pair of cy cycling shoes um, is absolutely you know, paramount. You need to get cycling shoes. I mean, um, there's quite a lot of people who come into the sport who don't really know a lot about it. And um, you know, if you're riding in trainers, first and foremost, uh, uh, the primary thing in cycling is to get the power down. So you need a nice, a relatively stiff frame and stiff and stiff shoes uh, to make sure you don't lose any transmission of power. So if you can think, mate, that uh, if you're on a bicycle and you're, you're running as hard as you can and your trainers are flexing, that's what a lot of the power is basically being lost in forward motion to bend your trainers. Also, it's not particularly very good for your feet. So cycling shoes these days are very, very stiff. Go to any decent cycling shop, they'll get you fitted. But I would say that cycling shoes are basically extremely important if you're doing any modicum of cycling at all. Uh, there's, a, there's, a great, there's a great variety out there at varying price points, so uh, get yourself down to your local buy shop. And again, I think Dan will agree with me that they're yeah, pretty imperative. Uh, no, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Dan. No, no, I, think you're, I think you're right. I mean, obviously, you know, if you're just getting into cycling and you've bought a you know, bike for 
two or four hundred pounds, then you know it comes with toe clips and straps. There's nothing to stop you going out with trainers. But as you progress in the sport and you want to get you know more out of yourself and more out of your equipment, I'd say one of the first things you should do is to upgrade the pedals and get some proper cycling shoes that fit you well as well. And as Matt said, that you know equates to more power transfer going through the uh, the pedals and less less wastage. And uh, you know you can walk down the street like a proper cyclist, looking like an idiot when you walk in cleats. Or you could go for a mountain bike shoes and uh, have the option of actually walking around quite normally. Uh, so something in between a cycling shoe and a trainer might be, you know, depending on how much cycling you either do, uh, maybe look at the SPD, the um, mountain bike shoe option as well. So you've got a few options there, mate, anyway. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. So another question on Grand Tours. Mauricio Alcina on Twitter has asked, what do you think about cyclists who ride in flat terrain and can they win a Grand Tour? So I guess was would the last guy who did that would that have been Moza in the Giro? Did they not tailor a Giro course to one of the Italian favourites? I know. Is the question somebody that that has grown up with flat terrain, or is it? Uh, I think he's he's talking about say a rider who specialises in the flatter terrain, so maybe a time trialist along kind of in the Tony Martin mould. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I well it doesn't seem at all likely in this day and age that anyone that's uh, you know, not predict, particularly good at climbing is um, is going to be able to win a Grand Tour. But at the same time, you know, last year's winner of the Grand Tour, the Tour de France, Bradley Wiggins, for many years previous, was known as somebody that could really only go very fast on the flat in time trials or on the track uh, doing the team pursuit or the individual pursuit. And he transformed himself, so you can never say never. But if it's, you know, if the question's coming from the other perspective as to, you know, somebody that's grown up with flat terrain can they win a Grand Tour? And I guess you only have to look at the uh, you know Dutch riders that have done so well over the years and you know, come from a very flat country. But there's no more fans than Dutch fans up out do it, and that's because a lot of their riders over the last years have done very well up there. Yeah, definitely. You got Zutemel, Peter Winnen, uh, Gert Jan Turner, Sir Stephen Brooks, all all guys who excelled in the mountains. Now, did Zutemel win the tour, or did was he second? And that was very very close. So it doesn't preclude preclude you at all. Um, from being born in the flatlands, but again, if you're born in a country where there's lots and lots of hills, it certainly isn't a disadvantage, it's probably going to help you more. Perfect. Okay, so next up, some people have been asking about cross-training activities for the winter months. So Dan, what did you like to do when you weren't riding your bike in the winter? Well, I was fairly boring in that my only interest then and probably now was cycling, uh, I, but I did attempt to do some gym for a few years and got quite a good program and uh, I did get stronger in terms of the fact that I could lift more weight, but I was always dubious and didn't really actually ever know whether the gym directly helped me on the bike, which is actually all I was particularly interested in. Uh, and I think the debate really is not closed yet. I certainly track rise if you're a sprinter, uh, probably if you're a sprinter on the road as well, the likes of Cattell, Cavendish, Greipel, they probably all do some gym during the winter. If you're a Grand Tour contender for the overall, I'd say actually you probably don't really need to do much in the way of, of weight, although I'm so sure some of them still do. I mean, it's not particularly a, a sport which is determined by strength. And I always give the example of saying, you know, my wife could do the same amount of power as Chris Froome. The thing is that she can only do it for 10 seconds, whereas Chris Froome can do it for 45 minutes or an hour. It's, uh, you know, it's not that she's not strong enough to go that fast. It's that she, you know, just can't sustain it. She's not fit enough. And so, you know, unless you are a sprinter, I wouldn't say that you need to go down the gym. Effectively, if you've got, you know, living in a country where you can't ride your bike over the winter, I think, you know, depending on what level you're racing at during the season, just keeping fit with any any other kind of sport, really, and doing the occasional indoor training session, following along to, to one of our videos, of course, then, you know, I think that's adequate, really. But, you know, as long as you're doing something, some sort of activity, you know, three or four days, maybe five days a week, I think that's fine. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously, I come from an era where, uh, when I say come from an era, I'm just a little bit like a decade older than Dan. And in the 80s and the 90s, you know, we did do, you know, it's like circuit training in the gym. But uh, as, as Dan said, more and more now, you know, cycling is a sport, unless you are like a, you know, a big powerhouse and a track sprinter where, you know, um, or, a key, or a kilo rider as was, um, you do a lot of your training would be in the gym. But now, you know, if you're a professional cyclist, you just need to ride your bike. But the other thing I would counter that with is, uh, there's no harm in going to the gym. Uh, there's no harm in doing a little bit of swimming, maybe some jogging, even just long walks. A, a lot of the pro teams now they will just um, they go out on outward bound expeditions, and, and so 
they won't do anything particularly extreme, but they'll just go on long walks, and a lot of riders like rambling and go hill walking. So just so these long, because obviously the, the muscle groups are very different, and um, sometimes the harsh change could you, could you could injure yourself. But I think variety is the spice of life in, in, in any sense, and I think the good thing about doing something else, you know, whether you want to mountain bike, you go walking, is just to break them the, the very hard monotony of cycling. Um, and sometimes it's not just the physical side of you, it's the mental side that doing another sport can give you a bit of a mental break to refresh you um, psychologically as well as physiologically as well. So I think anything, as long as things aren't too expre extreme, as long as, that, you know, like, like Dan said, three or four days a week, just keep yourself moderately active uh, and keep riding your bike. Cool. So another, another one from the YouTube comments. Dan Baxter has asked, what was your guy's favourite race of the year? And he said that his was either the Paris-Roubaix the World Championships Road Race or the Outdoor Stage, and this one links nicely into the GCN Awards that we're running at the moment. So we'll put a link up to that in the comments. But cool. back well, to the races, Matt. It was a, it was a great season. There was lots and lots of exciting racing. You know, I watched all the classics, most of the tours, um, and there's a lot of exciting moments. So to actually extract one particular moment is difficult. But I'd have to say. Uh, Dan Martin's win in um, in Liège Bastille Liège for me. Um, you know, Dan's a friend, but just the way I think the way Garmin rode that race, and it was you know a shining example of how sometimes a race can unfold if a team's well drilled. Um, and in the finale, the Dan World Championships Road Race or the Outdoor Stage, and this one links nicely into the GCN Awards. Got a bit of a sorry, there. I had a bit of a feedback loop. Sorry. There. Uh, so no, it was just it was just a. Garmin rode particularly well in the finale, uh, and the way Ryder Hivedale set up Dan in the finale, uh, and the way Dan jumped across to uh, Rodriguez in the final kilometre and encountered him, it was just perfect. And uh, um, I think I don't think Dan could really believe what had happened. It was just one of those perfect days, and it was very, very exciting bike racing in, in the final sort of 10 or 15 kilometres that had me, and I think everybody else from the edge, edge of the seat. And as well as it being an exciting race, it was. Uh, a coming of age, I think, for Dan Martin as well. You know, he's been an exceptional rider for the last few years, and to win a monument in the way he did and the way his team performed was a, was a shining example of of, uh, of consummate teamwork, really, which is um, which wonderful for any any fan or professional to watch. So that's my view. Yeah, I had quite a few sort of you know races that I really really enjoyed watching this year. You know, the last stage of the Giro d'Italia, which was just a you know relative procession for the majority of it, but you know Mark Cavendish coming across and, and winning and also winning some of the intermediate sprints and take his first ever points jersey there. That was uh, quite a special moment. I always absolutely loved the cobbled classics, not just Paris Bay and Tour of Flanders, but the even the small one day races like E3 and uh, Doors de Vlaanderen, which lead into it. They're my uh, favourite races of the year, so I mean I absolutely love that whole period of, of racing in Belgium. If anyone ever gets a chance to, to head over to Belgium at that time, it's just a, an absolutely fantastic experience as a cyclist, just to kind of soak up the whole atmosphere of, of the weeks and or the last week in particular leading up to the Tour of Flanders is incredible, but uh, I mean I love Paris-Roubaix as well because uh, you know, I was hoping that Seth Van Mark would do well on the way up to it and uh, he was very long odds going into it, but he he really did well. You know, he came uh, away with Fabian Cancellara, and for a long time, I thought he was going to be the guy who who came out on top because he's not a bad sprinter. Seth, he's he's beaten uh, Tom Bonin, I think, in a in a sprint finish to win the Het News Bad a couple of years ago, and I had him on as the as the favourite. Cancellara couldn't drop him, which he couldn't. But uh, in the end, Fabian showing his experience and Seth his uh, lack of, and uh, but yeah, fantastic race that we didn't know the outcome until the finish line. Cool. Yeah, I think my, my favourite moment was probably the stage I really enjoyed was the crosswind stage at the Tour de France. Yeah, I great. can't remember which stage number it was, but just just kind of watching the race blow apart there and wondering what sort of time gap the Saxo guys would get on through was a pretty good... I was actually waiting in an airport for a flight, so it was a few hours well spent for me there. Yeah, the great, you know, the great thing about that stage was there were still sort of two parts playing out, weren't there? There was the, uh, you know, the, the, the guys trying to Game time on GC, firstly through dropping Valverde and, you know, somewhat dubiously, uh, you know, continuing to chase the Belkin riders. But, um, you know, when it when it split towards the end, you know, seeing Froome isolated almost on his own and then some of the GC riders in the front, predominantly Constor, of course, Kreutziger as well and some of their teammates. But we also had the stage went up for grabs, Cavendish being beaten, I think, the day before that. And then coming back and, you know, he still had to beat Peter Sagan and, you know, 
Quick step played it really well in the final with I think it was Nicky Turks going up the road just briefly and then allowing Cavendish to sit on. It was uh, it was a stage that certainly had everything. Awesome. So we've had another question on winter training. So Charles Potter, who's from Sheffield, has asked, "What is your recommended destination for heading abroad for some February and March sun?" Ontario. Um, sorry, yeah. Matt. Sorry, Dan. So Charles Potter, who's from Sheffield, has asked where you'd recommend he heads for some. February sunny training. Yeah, Ontario. Ontario. Is that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take uh, this. I think, well, I guess it depends where he uh, is living at the moment, really. It's for, you know, certainly for us Europeans, you know, Northern Europeans, the Brits, the Belgians, the, the Dutch, etc., they tend to head down to you know, Mallorca in the, in the springtime, and if it's over the winter months, they quite often head off to the uh, Island of Tenerife or the Grand Canaria or you know one of those um, Canary Islands out there because the the weather is so good year round. It's basically sort of getting a trade off between you know somewhere that's got good weather but also has you know good roads and hills and uh, you know not too much traffic. But um, certainly certainly in Europe those are the places I'd recommend. I think uh, I think the guys from from Sheffield and, uh, and Dan, Dan touched pretty much on every place. But I think my, one of my favourite places in the last few years is, is Dan Dan will know and you Tom as well. Yeah. Is Tuscany. Um, probably it can be a little bit colder, but the roads will great, and apart from a little bit of rain, sometimes you can get a reasonable climate and, and very very quiet. I road. thought it was North Wales, Matt. Well, there's that as well, but I think from Sheffield, you wouldn't appreciate that. But of course, there is North Wales. Of course, get yourself over to Crew, and, and then ride to Aberystwyth. Then once you've had a nice hostel trip in, in a uh, stay over in Aberystwyth with a, with a nice curry, head north to Landudno, and on day three, head back uh, by Ruthin. You'll have a lovely three days out there, matey. But uh, if, if, if Wales isn't your thing, Tuscany is always a good second choice. It always hails in Wales, especially for Matt's <laughs> January training camps. <laughs> okay, um, so we've got a question on Fabian Cancellara and the Ardennes Classics. So Fabian's mentioned that he's going to be going for the hour record and that his yeah. contract, which finishes in 2016, could be one of his last. So do you think that alongside the hour record he might shoot for things like Liège, Matt? Um, I don't think it's out of his... Um, I, don't think, I don't think he can't... The only difficult thing with Fabian is he's on, on the heavier side, but he can get over some big hills. I mean, if Mirror recalls, Fabian hasn't won the Tour of Switzerland in the past, so that the guy can climb. It's just um, how motivated he is. Um, and I think if he did want to focus on the Ardennes Classics, he would have to have a, a completely different winter programme um, you probably have to lose a few pounds. He might lose a little bit of, um, obviously, if he's going to go for the hour rock, he's going to be focused on doing time trialing, etc., etc. And, and then as a consequence of that, he would be more suited to, to do well, as he traditionally has in Flanders and Roubaix. If he was to focus on, on the Ardennes, um, he would have to have, a, I would imagine, um, a completely different race program. I think physiologically, it's not out of his, um, it's certainly not impossible, um, but to, uh, it would it would certainly be an interesting, um, yeah, an interesting situation if he were to sort of announce he's going to target those classics. I, I personally don't think he will, but we should say, I don't what do you think, Dan? I think, you're, I think you're right in that I think he is capable of, you know, if he has a great day and he's on form, winning certainly Amstel Gold, maybe Lairs based on the age as well. As you rightly said, he'd already won the Tour of Switzerland overall, and of course, you know, maybe it wasn't the hilliest Tour of Switzerland that year, but he started to go over mountains and... Uh, we saw it in the Tour of Spain this year as well when he was helping Chris Horner on the front before he retired from the race to concentrate on the World Time Trial Championships. He he, uh, you know, he often whittled the group down to 25, 30 riders, which for a guy of 80 kilograms plus is is quite impressive. I think the stumbling block and the problem always for, for Fabian is that if he's on absolutely top form, he's not he's almost guaranteed of winning either Flanders or Paris Bay, whereas he's, if he's on absolutely top form, he's not necessarily guaranteed in winning uh, Amstel Gold, Liège, or Flesh Malone. So I guess you know that's a, a big gamble, really. If you can add another more, you know, another couple of really big monuments to your name, Milan San Remo, of course, as well, then I guess you you know you're going to try and focus on that. And if you try and focus on them and then continue, that's never going to work because you know as he did this year, he had fantastic form. But if you've got two goals in your mind for you know, for months and months and months, and you achieve both, and it's very difficult to then carry on for even just one or two more weeks. At, you know, mentally as much as physically. Okay, so kind of back to the hour record. Mellow Home on Twitter again has asked that, or has said that Tony Martin has also spoken about the hour record, and would he be able to beat Cancellara? Do you know what I think they should do? 
Because I, 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 back in '96, I was privileged to be at the Velodrome in Manchester when Chris Baldwin broke the hour record. And it was a great day, um, and I was, you know, what in GB teams and you know with with, with Chris and, and with Graham O'Brien, you know, around that kind of period where they were basically at loggerheads with each other. You know, one week one would, would have the record, and the next week the other. Um, yeah, I, I think yeah, it'd be great if Bradley Wiggins and and, and Fabian Cancelo and Tony Marson went for it. It looks like they are going to, but. I think they should be on the side of the track. I think they should do it in a pursuit. I think if you get a backer to finance that, uh, I'd certainly put a tenner in the ring uh, to help finance it. Only modest, but it's just you know an indication of my intent, really. So, uh, so if, if you're listening, guys, a pursuit with a view to the winner taking the arrow. I mean, what a fantastic idea! I mean, they've already got three pounds thirty-three each on the table. But, well, there you go. That's, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Would it need a three-sided track, though? <laughs> or would one of them, would you start them at thirds of the track? Would one of them have to start in the bend? I don't know. I don't know. That's quite no, we, yeah, I think, you know, we've thought about it a little bit, but probably not quite enough. <laughs> no. Maybe on consecutive days at the same venue or something like that. Like a, like a, a weekend, you know, Fabian goes for Saturday and Tony Martin goes for Sunday. How uh, far did Bourbon ride when you watched him in 96? He went, he did that crazily, he went about 54, 53 and a half Ks or something like that. I think oh, it was not. where he was in the, in the Superman position. Um, he, he, he did go quite a long way in that hour, um, I must admit. And he looked quite tired at the end of it as well. I think it was about 56, wasn't it? It was, it was, yeah, I think it was 54 in the regular position and 56 can hour in the Superman position. It was absolutely yeah. ridiculous. So what average speed that is? That, that's as, almost as quick as I can sprint. Actually faster than I can sprint. <laughs> But no, yeah, it'd be great to see those two guys. It, it, I mean, it, it, in all fairness, you know, Borman did do over 56 kilometres in one hour, and if anyone's ever out on their bike that's watching this, if you just put, you know, if you've got your bike computer in miles per hour, just flick it over to kilometres per hour for one ride and start going down a hill. And when you reach 56, if you can reach 56, just think somebody's averaged this for an hour on a flat track. Well, we did that the other week in filming one of our videos, didn't we? And I think at one point we reached the giddy heights of 52k an hour down the hill, all three of us, and we were on our knees. So yeah, please try that at home, folks, and that would indicate how tough how tough the hour is. But uh, yeah, let's hope they, they do it anyway. It should be great. Those in Britain don't ride at 56 kilometres an hour through a residential area because you will be breaking the speed limit by you heard it here a healthy five miles an hour there. So moving on from the velodrome and the track, we'll maybe a few guys have asked about how best to train during the winter months when you've got limited time. So obviously we've spoken about doing volume and steady miles, but how would you fit volume and steady miles into four to six hours? And Matt, you're probably the go-to guy for this, having combined a successful pro career with you know a full-time job at the same time. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, for the lot, well, up until I retired, I was working full-time, you know, as a police officer and, and racing at, you know. It, a relatively okay international level, primarily domestically, but at a good level. And uh, yeah, I, I think the key um, is ma is being honest with yourself and managing your time effectively. But sometimes, what can be the driver in relation to managing your time is the fact if you do work full time, you know you've only got a limited amount of time to do um, to train in. So the training tends to be quite focused. And um, yeah, it's it can have yeah the flip side of working full time is it can be a motivator, especially if you do want to race. Um, and, and I found, although it's very, very difficult, I found the turbo training with my, with my friend and my, and, and my enemy. I didn't tend to ride a lot in the dark, so I used to do um, a lot of quite intense stuff all the way through the winter. Um, but I think to complement that, because riding on the turbo is, you know, physically and men not more mentally draining, is the fact that if, if, you, if you, at any point when you're working full time, you feel tired, is be honest with yourself and don't be afraid to, to take a day off. Um, but you know. Um, I would say if you've got between four and six hours a week to train, out of that you need to do two or three hours a week on the road if you can, and I, I, I would suggest that would be on a Saturday or Sunday on the club run. Um, but then in the week, you know, during the winter, if you're riding every other day, I would do a relatively intense turbo session. Um, I wouldn't bother with any intervals until the new year, but this time of year, I'd, I'd maybe do a 40 minute to an hour session. Five or ten minute warm up, and then ride. You know, not quite a time. You know, if you're kind of max heart rate one eight five, for example, ride at about one forty or one fifty, and keep the cadence quite high. But then chop and change as well. Um, my my kind of training methods are quite unorthodox, but what I tried to incorporate was riding at very very different cadences for the same heart rate, 
Um, but um, but made sure each session um, I knew that I had a hard workout. And if you do, I'd say three three to four 40 minute sessions a week during the winter, complemented by one two three a ride on the weekend, that will put you in particular good stead for for the new year. And that will you know get you through the tour of Britain in September and kind of put you well up there at the nationals. Matt really is the man when it well, comes to compact training weeks. It's yeah, I think it's it's just a matter of uh, yeah knowing when to back off the road because you can easily burn out. The turbo is an instrument of torture, but if you use it right, it can it can really bring you on in leaps and bounds. But again, you have to complement it with the road. But you use wisely. Yeah, I think anybody can can benefit at whatever level they are. Okay, so we actually we should probably go on to a three or four minute countdown now because I think we planned this to be 40 minutes and we're already on 42 but we'll, we'll give you 45 so we'll move on to the next question um, someone else has mentioned Tony Martin's break at the Vuelta is one of their most exciting days of the year I don't know if it was Dan or Matt or, or Matt on the ground at the Vuelta there that day I was on the ground I don't I think pretty did you watch it, Dan? Because I was on the ground and uh, we didn't see anything apart from the last. No, match. I didn't. I didn't watch it, and uh, I'm just I, reading on Twitter that Morkov had won, and of yeah. course we were following him for our ride at Dari, so I was absolutely ecstatic. So my memories from the day is just being really pleased with the chat because he's just a genuinely very nice bloke, and to sort of have somebody that you're following for a long time win a stage of a Grand Tour is a great feeling. We had it twice, luckily this year with. Alex Dowsett as well winning the time trial stage at the Giro. So I was I was just super, super happy with the guy. I think I gave one of you a call out there to sort of say how does he feel. But I think most people's predominant memory from watching the stage was really wanting Tony Martin to take the victory and to, to take the stage, which of course didn't happen partly, I think, or mainly I would say down to, to Fabian Cancellara pulling the bunch back at the very last minute. But uh, but my abiding memories are thinking I was, uh, was very pleased for, for Mikhail. Yeah, I think, I think my memory was, I saw, saw that Tony was out front, and I think with 20k to go, um, we saw he only had a minute, so basically I, I, I then had other things to do with the producer over there, um, Tom, and uh, the next thing we need more covered one, but it's only watching the highlights that we realised that Tony had actually held them off, you know, with, with one of the most incredible rides of the year, so uh, but again, it, it was a day, of, you know, for us at GCN, it was great, the more covered one, but on reflection, you know what a ride that, that Tony obviously did, and I think there's lots of other people who'd say that's one of their favourite rides of the year, regardless of the results. Definitely. So, around a minute to go, I think we'll have a couple of really quick ones. So, Dan Thomas Pevelin via Facebook has asked, "Why do cyclists drink coke after a race?" I read that question earlier. I'm not entirely sure. I think it, I mean, for me personally, I was never really into drinking coke on a day-to-day -day basis, but there was something about. Uh, of cold coke at the end of a long hot race that I did used to crave and uh, I, I don't think there's anything too scientific apart from that it's got you know caffeine and lots of sugar in it which you can take towards the end of a, of a race to give you a boost but uh, for me it was personally just a tasting. And uh, another one is what do you guys think of electronic shifting? Um, I've tried you know both Shimano and Campagnolo across the range so Duras, um, Ultegra and Athena record and chorus. Um, and it's great. It really is lovely. Um, they're both both sets have got a different feel. I think it is the way forward. It certainly isn't for everybody. And I think the only it's very good shifting. Just make sure your batteries are charged. If you can afford it, go for it. It's 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 lovely. But by the same token, it has a very very different feel than than traditional uh, than traditional shifting. And it might not be for everybody, but I think it's um, the sport's heading in that direction. It's it's a, it's a natural kind of progression, and I personally really like it, and would be happy to use either Campagnolo or Shimano. Okay, so we've got one that we're going to save for Matt at the very end to close the hangout, but I think we'll throw one to Dan now. So Dan's last question is: Dan, how do you think the Giro going to Ireland will work out for the Irish guys? So I don't even know if any of them are starting, but well, yeah, Dan Martin is definitely doing it. I'd imagine Nick Nicholas Roach, particularly after his performance at the uh, at the Vuelta at the end of last year will be also hoping to do it potentially even as a, a team leader so there'll be certainly two there um, I think it will be great for, I think it'll be great for the country of course they had a, such a big following of cycling after the Stephen Roach Sean Kelly years and it maybe dwindled just slightly but uh, they've got some great riders now and Philip Dagden I guess maybe as well might be there from Team Sky uh, supporting you, I mean, perhaps Richie Port. So I think they're going to have some some home guys to cheer for as well. And uh, you know, even if it's peeing down with rain, at least there'll be a lot of Guinness flowing. <laughs> Excellent.
Okay, so Matt, the final question. Someone has been admiring your flowing locks, and they want to know how, just how do you get your hair so curly? And that's Max Buster on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I, I'm happy to ping you my uh, my details. We can talk about it at more length because it's 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 not something that happens overnight. You know, um, I was born quite a long time ago, uh, and ever since the early 70s, I have been focusing on eating crusts, um, and that has you know led to me developing quite quite a tress of hair. Um, it, but the bottom line is, it, it is very very natural, but it's helped by a lot of products that I use, yeah. obviously natural products. Um, but as I say, you know, uh, my details are on here. Uh, I'm happy to talk through, um, you know, with anybody at length, um, you know, about about how it is that I present who I am. And uh, as I say, it's uh, you're not the only person to ask that, but I'm, I'm happy to oblige. Okay, oh, so. Me. <laughs> I think I'm going to get my coat. Yeah. On that note, uh, thanks everyone for joining us on the live hangout. Thanks Dan and thanks Matt. Pleasure. You've had it all. Beauty tips, German cycling, and the hour record. Indeed. Cheers. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye.